Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. I am back with part two of the message, Stand Up and Fight. And this is part two. And before we get into this, I just want to pray and, and we'll just dig in because God has, has something really important to share. And he told it to me just to relay it to you. So let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus for everything that you are doing in this world, Lord. It may look confusing, but Lord, you are in control. Lord, we are excited because everything signals your return. So Lord, just help us to get in place to do your will, to be in right standing with you, um, to love one another and to love you, Lord, with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our and all our strengths. So, so right now we just commit our lives to you. Lord, help us to be lights for you to spread your love and your peace and your joy and the gospel, Lord, to everyone who needs it. Help us to stand up and fight and be strong until the end and have a strong finish. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I am finally back with part two. And I'm glad there was actually a delay because... A lot has happened in the past couple of weeks and this message has really become real to me. I mean, when I say we have to stand up and fight, we have to stand up and fight. And just want to let you know, just because you won one day, that doesn't mean you'll win the next day. We have to fight every single day. And what are we fighting for? We are fighting for our faith and our relationship with Christ. And when the enemy wants to get rid of you, he attacks your foundation. He attacks our relationship with Christ. I know my relationship with Christ has been attacked this week and um and I'll tell you why you might be surprised in the way in which the enemy attacks I know I was it's never happened to me before so um we're going to recognize five common tactics of the enemy so you can win the battle for your soul and I might have one more for you that just happened to me this morning a sneaky one and so we might be six by the time I get finished with this but um let's just jump in okay the number one way the enemy attacks us is number one through sin, you know, just straightforward, just sin. But what we need to be aware of are hidden sins like refusing to forgive or murmuring or complaining or resisting delegated authority. You know, authority God has, been, has put in place over our lives like the authority and respect we should show our parents, our pastors and leaders, um, people he's put in rulership over us like governing authorities. We need to be aware of those type of hidden sins, just being angry and murmuring, realizing that every person that's in power, God has placed them there, whether they um, seem godly or not. He's placed them there, and we are to pray for our leaders. And then also ask God to show us, Lord, what are you doing in this situation? How would you like me to respond? And let's not make a practice of just venting and running off at the mouth about what God is doing, because when you criticize um, delegated authority someone God has put in place you will receive um, the recompense for that so we want to be careful of that that is a sin you know sometimes we think we can just vent oh it's no big deal um, remember the children of Israel who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years trying to get into the uh, promised land number one thing they did complain and murmur against Moses and Aaron and you know what um, they died in they died in the wilderness God judged them and we don't want to be like that we want to be of that group that goes in with Joshua and goes into the promised land so let's make sure let's put a guard over our mouth okay um, Ecclesiastes 9 8 says let your clothes be white all the time and let not oil be lacking on your head and then Revelation 3 Verse 5 says, he who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all the hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. So we need to walk in the fear of the Lord. Knowing that the Lord loves us, but just know that he sees everything. And I like this picture here because it shows this man and woman. They have on these all white clothes. It looks awesome. But think about how carefully you act when you wear all white. I mean, you don't just go jump in mud puddles when you are you have on all white. I mean, because you want to look good. You might even carry a little thing of spot cleaner with you in case you get something on it. So you can, you know, quickly get that off. And that's 
how we need to treat our walk with the Lord. He has given a, us a beautiful white robe of righteousness that he paid for, a very expensive garment. It cost him his life. And he died so we can have that beautiful white robe of righteousness. We want to be careful with it and make sure we don't get it, it dirty. We don't want a spot or a stain on our garment. But then this is the good news. If we do happen to get something on our garment, if we sin, we can go to the Lord and ask him to cleanse us, right? But, you know, just like when you wear white, you don't, you want to just keep it clean. So that's our focus. Focus on the Lord. Focus on doing his will keeping that garment clean but if you need help if you you get something on your garment repent go to god ask him for, for his forgiveness but that's the number one strategy the enemy will use against us is sin because you know the moment you sin you really um you go under uh condemnation and that separates you from the throne of grace so then what you need to do is go before the throne of grace repent and ask for help because, you know, if you sin, then you feel guilty, like, oh, I don't want to go before God because I've sinned. No, don't, leave, go, don't go away from God. Go towards him asking for forgiveness. Number two, legalism. We don't want to um, let legalism separate us from the love of God. And that is when we put rules higher than Christ. And I'll give you an example. And this is just a simple one. I was on my way to um, church on Sunday. You know, most time you want to be on time for church and most time your pastor and stuff you know they'll say okay guys be on time be on time so you'll try really hard and then sometimes you know you won't make it on time but this this sunday was a little test so i was on my way to church and i see someone under a bus shelter and it's really cold it's really rainy and i'm like you know i notice and it's kind of that, like that little sense you hear like you need to go stop and, and say something to that person or, or bless them or do something for that person and i'm thinking well i'm, I'm for once, you know, I'm actually going to be on time, not running a little bit late, but like really on time. And I really want to be on time. <laughs> and then I had to think about, OK, why are we here? Right. We're here to love one another. That's like one of the highest laws. Right. Love one another. Love God. So what good is it being the church on time if we don't have time to stop and help someone or, or just share God's love? So this time, fortunately, um, I was did not act legalistic, but I followed the leading of the Holy Spirit, and I, I did stop and just share whatever what the Lord would have me to share. But um, I have to admit, I haven't always won that battle in the past. But it's one way that sep one thing that the devil uses to separate us from us from God is legalism. You know, doing something that seems right, but is not really the right thing to do. It's not what God is leading you to do. So we want to always follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Another way people get legalistic is um, in your spiritual dis disciplines. We wanna be disciplined, we wanna go to church, we wanna fellowship with other believers, we wanna read our Bible, pray, but don't get so legalistic about it where it is, you know, sometimes God wants to mix it up. He wants to change the time that you pray with him or he wants to, um, he'll get you up even earlier than what you're used to or you know, it might be a little longer or a little shorter. Or he just likes to mix things up sometimes. Then that, that keeps it fresh and, and, and wonderful. And so don't get so much in a pattern where you don't recognize where God is wanting to change the pattern. Okay, so um, again, with the legalism, we're not saying that, you know, if somebody says, oh, you need to pray and faith. Uh, and pre if someone says, okay, let's fast and pray. You can't say, well, no, I'm under grace. I don't need to fast and pray, you know, because Jesus said we need to fast and pray. So we need to, but don't get legalistic about it. Okay. Follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, and of course, don't use grace as an excuse to sin. Legalism is not um, avoiding sin like fornication and adultery and all that. That's not being legalistic when you refuse to do those things. That's being holy. Okay. So we want to pursue holiness. Number three, false doctrine. That's another way in which the devil tries to separate us from God. Okay, we want to focus on Jesus and lean on the Holy Spirit as we read the Bible and we won't be deceived. Um, what false doctrine will do is it will get you so focused on a detail that you miss God altogether. So, you know, don't get off on tangents where the main thing you're focusing on is, is you know, maybe uh, what Bible version you're reading or what day of the week you know you're worshiping god if you're focused so much on that sometimes you can miss jesus altogether. okay not saying you know people are have their own convictions about those things and um 
you know, in the Bible, it's the Apostle Paul says, don't let any man judge you in those matters for as far as what you eat or what you drink or what um, day you worship on or what festivities you celebrate, okay? It's there in the Bible. So don't get so focused on just a small detail that you miss Jesus altogether. That's what the Pharisees did. You know, they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath all the time. They accused him of being a wine bibber, a drunkard. They accused him of hanging out with the wrong people. Um, they accused him of healing. Uh, you know, when he did a good work, they got mad at that. Um, they said, well, you shouldn't have done it on that day. That was the wrong day to heal that woman. Or, you know, just when you want to find a problem with someone, you will. Uh, whether, whether they're a holy person or not. If you want to find something wrong with someone, you will. But let's do this. Let's make a habit of thinking the best of others. That's what um, God commands us to do. And hate is a heavy load to carry or and being angry or being upset. It's really a heavy weight. If you keep love in your heart and mind and you keep good thoughts and good intentions towards others, you become so joyful. And, and when you have that joy, you're connected to God. The minute you get into um, having a critical mindset or being angry or being upset or finding fault, totally separates you from God. So let's avoid that. Number four, condemnation. Okay, the Holy Spirit convicts and restores, but the enemy condemns and destroys. So you, like, you see this woman, she's crumpled over and... Um, you know, she's needing for forgiveness, and there is Jesus right there to comfort her and for forgive her. And that's what God does for us. So he doesn't want us to sin, so the Holy Spirit will let you know, okay, that's not the right thing to do. That's not holiness. That's not the example Jesus set for you. But then he restores you. So he doesn't want you to stay in that place. Everything God does is to bring you back to restoration. But what the enemy wants to do is condemn you so you don't pray. You don't even want to associate with other Christians because you feel maybe ashamed being around them. And then he wants to destroy your, your faith, your walk with God. So just reject that. Um, even if you, when you, if you stumble, if you sin, go to Christ, ask for forgiveness, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And then just get right back up and keep fighting. Keep fighting for your faith. And I have this... Um, little example in here that God gave me. I want to talk about two women in the Bible. One is Rahab, the prostitute. She received God's approval because of her faith. Um, you can read about Rahab, I think, in Joshua chapters, maybe two through five or six. She is in there. And, you know, um, Rahab lived in the city of Jericho. And the Israelites um, were going to come and, you know, basically enter into the city of, of Jericho and, and, and take it over and, you know, bring down the wall. And Rahab was a citizen of Jericho. They were pagans, but she heard about the God of Israel and she believed. And when the spies came to check out Jericho, she actually hid them because she believed in God, in the God of Israel. She had faith. So when they actually came to her, her, her place or her home, her dwelling and say, hey, where are those men? Where are those spies? Um, Rahab covered for them. She said, I don't know where they went. Um, I don't know. She hid them. And so because of that, they made her a promise. They said, if you hang this red cord outside of your window, when we come in to destroy the city, we will save you. We will spare you. And that's exactly what happened. But what I want to stress to you is not only did they save her, they say, they say, everyone you bring into your home, we will spare. So she had her mother and her brothers and all her whole family in there and they say whoever you want to be saved bring them into the home with you so that lets you know that not only will God forgive you of your sins when you um, have faith he will actually put a covering over your household and this is the other thing that happened with Rahab she actually became um, a part of Israel she married into um, obviously she married someone that was an Israelite because later on she's actually in the genealogy of Christ and she's mentioned and a lot of times in genealogies they don't mention women at all so when they mention a woman's name in a genealogy that means that that person was significant and so she's actually men mentioned in the genealogy of Christ which is in, I think Matthew um, chapter 1 and woman of God look at this Mary the Virgin Mary she received God's approval because of her faith and I want to contrast these two women you have Rahab the prostitute who had a really sordid background. I mean, she wasn't a virtuous woman. She had faith, but she wasn't virtuous. And then we have the Virgin Mary, who was a virtuous woman. She had 
uh, found favor with God so much so she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus but look at this Rahab she definitely could have been accused of sin because she was obviously a sinner she was a, a, a harlot which is a prostitute but she had faith and she acted on that faith and it spared not only her but her whole household and then you have the Virgin Mary who was pure and virtuous and she was accused of being you know a promiscuous woman someone who who wasn't um pure but she was the both of the women had faith both of them had faith and it's interesting to me that God puts both of these women into the into the genealogy of Christ you have Rahab the prostitute who's in the genealogy and you have Mary the virtuous woman the virgin Mary who's who's actually the mother of Jesus so both of these women women of faith and are both in the lineage of Christ so to me that just lets me know that God when you if none of us um, are righteous without Christ we're only righteous through Christ so whether you have a sordid background or you have a pure background we all need Jesus and look he puts them both in the lineage of Christ which means that God viewed them in the same way both women needed Christ so be encouraged if you don't have a just a squeaky clean background it's okay, but you still need Christ because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So be encouraged with that. Do not let sin separate you from God. And don't let your righteousness separate you from God. Because even if you have a squeaky clean background, you still have some sin, whether it's in thought or deed. So one thing we want to, don't want to do is let become self-righteous. Because sometimes when we have a, a, a good moral lifestyle, we can become self-righteous and stop depending on on Jesus and even if you have a pretty good background it's like no you still need to be saved so keep that in mind and the last one number five is strife God operates in love and peace refuse all thoughts of criticism and offense towards other believers and this is one of the big ones I wanted to bring out this week take notice of how you're thinking about other people you would be surprised if you just think of um, take note of what you're thinking about all day how many times are you thinking negatively of someone? Okay, that is not of God. And what it does, that separates you from God's presence. But practice meditating not only on God and His goodness, but on the good things about other people. Just refuse all thoughts of um, criticism and fault finding and being disgruntled, complaining. You know, make the excuses for other people that you make for yourself. You know, if you do something wrong you got all kinds of excuses so when somebody else does something wrong why don't you use some of those same excuses for them and that'll just keep you in a place of humility where you know like hey they did that i've probably done the same thing and need need forgiveness and grace too and right now i'm going to talk about number six it wasn't on here earlier but i'm going to add it and it is confusion the enemy will throw some confusion at you and it's crazy and it's, it varies from person to person it happened to me this week so confused where I'm even down in Ooh, but, well does God really love me uh, should I even be doing these um, uh, little talks the sharing the word like this because what he wants to make you do is if he can make you confused about your relationship with Christ it'll shut you down you won't want to do anything for Christ because you're confused think about needing to go somewhere you're driving and all of a sudden you get lost right you you lose your place and you're not sure you're going the right direction you don't want to keep driving right you, you you just want to stop and get your bearings find out where you are so you can keep going that's how the enemy will try to confuse you he'll try to confuse you you know maybe in your your call what God has called you to do in your relationship with Christ whether or not you're doing the will of God, anything, it, it, it could be anything, but he'll just try to bring confusion in there. And when you're confused, you're not moving forward. So go back to the last sure thing that God told you and say, wait a minute, you know what? I am sure God told me this and I'm going to go for it. And I'll tell you what I did this morning. Because the devil tried to make me so confused. I wasn't even about to do this today. I said, you know what? I can do this thing confused. No problem. You know, if I'm confused about something, in my, that doesn't stop me from... Um, sharing God's word because God is not confused and as soon as I thought that way and said that that confusion left and I realized look at that that was just a little spirit that was a spirit sent to hinder me but I refuse to be confused and I refuse to be afraid fear is the other one that will shut you down being afraid I said devil I can do this afraid so what nothing nothing says that we can't do the will of God 
while we're afraid we can be afraid and confused and still do what God told us to do and so as soon as I thought that way everything cleared up and I remember clearly the instructions from the Lord and I was like I'm definitely getting this out this morning so I want to let you know number six is confusion and fear do not let it stop you you got to fight for your faith think about this how can you make it to the end if all of a sudden you're running the race and you're dazed you're confused and you're afraid that's how you defeat yourself we cannot allow ourselves to be confused and afraid so uh, again if you do not know the lord please receive him now we are so close to the end and i think that's why the fight is so intense this is the other thing i want to share with you if you have been bombarded with all kind of crazy thoughts just uh crazy thoughts attacking your mind whether it's thoughts of immorality or um maybe hurting yourself or depression or, or whatever it is just know that the enemy has just released the onslaught of of just uh, venom in the atmosphere and so don't be surprised if crazy things are hitting your mind but just know that it's a spirit you don't have to succumb to that um just quote the word of god out loud speaking um your heavenly language if you have that just pray play some good praise and worship music and that's what i did this week and it was amazing and i would direct you to read joshua 3 through 5 and it talks about how the children of israel when they got ready to go into jericho they were with the Lord, and this was their only strategy. He told them to stand still and do nothing. The only thing they needed to do was circle around the city and praise God. And he said, when I give, tell you to shout, that's when you shout. So right now, I think what, I'm, what God has me doing, and maybe what he has you guys doing too, just being in a place of worship and praise. I'm not worried about anything going on out there. I'm just praising the Lord. And when he comes back, I will be ready to shout, and I hope you'll be ready to shout too. Remember, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now you um, stay in faith. Keep praying for me. I definitely need it. Um, thank you so much for anyone who has subscribed. If you viewed it, I am praying for you. I, every time I pray for myself, I'm praying for all of you. And I pray a, a lot because it's needed. There's a lot going on. We have to be people of prayer. Um, and I love you. I will be before you again soon and whenever the Lord gives me something else to share. In the meantime, be blessed. Stay strong in faith and fight. Don't give up for anything. And I love you. God bless.